we have finally reached the final of the FIDE World Cup. We started with 128 players and we're now down to the final two. Temil Rajabov from Azerbaijan and Ding Liren from China who are playing for first prize which is $110,000 and second prize only $80,000. Of course both players win qualification to the candidates tournament uh, so they're playing for pride and you know some some decent prize money as well and they they play four classical games and then if they're tied we get the tie breaks their first classical game was frankly not very interesting apparently Rajabov forgot or, or, or had prepared something but wasn't satisfied with it at the board and instead played a very uh, standard line of the martial attack that ended in this position after sort of uh, 30, 30 minutes or so, um, 33 moves, you know, roughly half an hour. The players played their moves very quickly. They've even played this line themselves before and reached a draw. Um, so a bit of a disappointment in this first classical game. However, there is another match taking place. The match for third and fourth place between Yu Yang Yi and Maxime Vachilagrav. And this game was more interesting. Now, third place receives $60,000. Fourth place, $50,000. Well, you know, both players can be pretty satisfied with that, with that kind of money as well. Um, but it hasn't been confirmed to me. Um, I'm trying to get confirmation of this. It's possible that the winner of this match will actually receive the wild card into the candidates tournament. So this is really something. There is potentially a huge amount at stake in this match. Certainly... I mean, whether this is in the regulations or not, I mean, I couldn't see it in the regulations for the tournament. Certainly, they would have a strong moral position to claim that wild card spot in the candidates. Um, so let's have a look. Yu Yang Yi from China against Maxime Vachilagraf from France. And Yu Yang Yi went into uh, Maxime's Grunfeld and was obviously extremely well prepared because he went for this very sharp line which involves bringing the queen out early. Obviously that entails a risk. If you bring your queen out early it's liable to be attacked and what black gains time and, and the Grunfeld is well notoriously um, black gets all this peace play. However white in in playing the queen out has managed to establish a big center so this is where the battle lies can black use this slight lead in development to generate peace activity and well there are many ways of playing this e5 has been played by maxime before so you was clearly very well prepared for this so you can see black throws away a pawn just to open up lines, you can see that diagonal now open, the bishop on the same line as the queen. c6 starts the process of cracking open the center, attacking uh, the pawn on d5. Of course, knight takes d5 with a discovered attack on the queen is now a threat. So the queen steps out of the way. Black throws in another pawn. So it's now two pawns advantage for white, but this queen is kind of bobbling over the board and well the crucial thing of course is that white hasn't yet castled so can somehow white get his king to safety and keep hold of well let's say one of these pawns uh, and consolidate his position he's also way behind in developments on the queen side now maxime has actually had this position on four previous occasions with black so he knows the position pretty well and he scored two draws and two wins 
Previously, three of his opponents have played bishop g5, and one of them played bishop d3. Maxime didn't really have problems in any of these games. But you, obviously playing his moves very quickly, had prepared this move e5. New move, uh, but Maxime, well, he gathered himself for a couple of minutes here, but played knight g4 relatively quickly. And that means this pawn is under attack. Watch out for the queen as well. The pawn went on and the knight was hit. You playing these moves very quickly, so he'd obviously prepared this. But Maxime was ready as well because he started bashing out his moves after kind of collecting his thoughts after e5. So it was obvious that both players had, were still in their opening preparation. So white has given a pawn back, um, but he still has to bring the king to safety and look at black's pieces. I mean, they're all so active. I mean, this is the classic Grunfeld position, the so-called Botvinnik bishops, one on g7, one on e6, raking across the board. Um, here, well, if white gets the king to safety, then let's say, well, I, I dare say there are many good moves here. b4, um, bishop c4 is, is very simple, so that after this exchange, the knight comes and b2 is under fire. I mean, black, I would prefer black in that position, in spite of the, the pawn minus. Um, you played bishop b5. Now, that is the kind of move that you only make if you've actually prepared this at home, because, you know, you could be mated very quickly here. But bishop c4, let's have a look. Well, if bishop takes bishop, knight takes, and, well, the full force of white's rooks bearing down on the king, this is not a happy position for white. You took the rook, very scary, but both players playing pretty quickly, so they knew what they were doing. And Maxime took this knight, and now discovered check. Very scary, but the king creeps out and finds security. Now it's very safe on h2. Remember, there's no longer a dark squared bishop, that's quite important. And Maxime recaptured the bishop. Both players still in their preparation. That was absolutely clear. And in fact, that was confirmed by uh, Vachy Legrave after the game. He said, yeah, yeah, I've, I kind of knew it up to here. And, well, it's clear that white has a few chances here. Black's minor pieces, well, they, yeah, this is protected, um, but it's hard for black to attack anything. And, you know, white, well, starts the process of pinning, that makes life a little bit tricky. Of course, you would like to bring this rook into the game, but it's not so simple. Um, this this pawn is, is on prees now that the bishop has gone back to f7. Uh, potentially that pawn could be taken as well in some circumstances. So U gives back one of the pawns and that allows him to bring the rook into play with tempo. Uh, obviously if bishop takes pawn we have rook here uh, with a double attack. Uh, so after rook c1, well certainly black has to be a little bit careful here. Uh, bishop b5 played, keeping everything together. Now, just for the moment, that bishop is loose. It does protect the rook and the knight. Rook c7. So we have a material balance, rook and pawn against bishop and knight, but u is more active. Black is a bit hamstrung at the moment, that's clear. And the rook on the seventh looks superb here. So it's just a question of... Can black just kind of 
glue everything together. A6 is a good start, protects the bishop, but you have to watch out for this pawn advancing, of course. If white could bring this rook magically to the seventh rank, um, that would also be very interesting for white, but achieving that, well, it's very difficult because if you go to the D file, then that square is covered by the bishop. Um, if you try and bring the rook via the C file, well, obviously that's covered by the knight and the B file is blocked. And I think the only move which could be disruptive in this position is A4 and rook E4 just kind of prevents that pawn advancing. Rook d1, okay, in any case the rook wants to try and activate, well, rook d8 check in, uh, is of course a, a threat here, uh, but rook d4, good move. So shutting out the white rook. Exchange took place. Um, if white could somehow rush his king to f6, then that could be <laughs> a way for white to get the advantage, but it's very, very difficult. I mean, if white wants to play on here, you could you could try g4, oh, that's not g4, that's g4, and king up and maybe a little bit of a squeeze, but really black can get out of this. Um, perhaps maneuvering this knight round to d7 where it's protected, for example, and that will allow the king to step up the board um, or perhaps put the knight on f7 as well, which covers these dark squares and this pawn covers these squares, and then the king can step up. Basically, it's not possible for white to attack. So you decided it was time just to simplify and finish with this game. He had tested Maxime vachel grave and Maxime obviously had prepared this thoroughly some time before, I would say. So you was content just to trade pawns. And of course, this position is really, there's nothing to play for here. Uh, White has zero chance of making any progress in this position. So, uh, well, uh, you know, an interesting draw, but um, Maxime was was solid in the end. Uh, but this match could be the one to watch, actually. Um, let's, let's keep an eye on that. Well, you might have noticed a little bit of a difference in my, um, in my dress today. <laughs> so, I'm wearing a t-shirt for the Rugby World Cup, which is taking place in Japan. Um, and I'm going to be visiting Japan over the next few days and going to one of the matches, one of the England games. So I'm very excited about that, to be visiting uh, a country I haven't been to before. And I'm really excited about um, experiencing Japanese culture and, of course, you know, watching a, a good game of rugby as well. So that means I won't be covering the final few games of the FIDE World Cup. However, I have a replacement and a more than adequate replacement. Uh, my friend and colleague, Grandmaster Yannick Peltier from Switzerland will be giving reports on these final games. Uh, if not all of them, then the most interesting ones anyway. So look out for his coverage and uh, he will be doing a fantastic job, I know. Should be very interesting. So keep watching Power Play Chess and there's going to be some good stuff coming up on the channel soon. I'll also be uh, coming back to Fisher's Road to Reykjavik. That's coming up soon. The Fisher Petrosian uh, final of the candidates in 1971. So watch out for those. And after that, of course... It's the FIDE Grand Swiss Tournament in the Isle of Man, uh, which will feature Magnus Carlsen and, well, so many strong players. It, it will be an amazing tournament. So plenty coming up on the channel and do check out the games over the next few days. Thanks everyone for your comments. 
uh, and, and everything else over the past few weeks. It's been such an exciting tournament. I always love the FIDE World Cup. Uh, I like the knockout format. And remember, do like, comment, share and subscribe. And if you enjoyed the coverage, then do consider supporting us. Um, you can check out the links to PayPal or patreon.com and enjoy the rewards on Patreon. There are extra videos and newsletters and stuff like that. Thanks everyone for watching. Bye now.